We're going to be in Matthew chapter 24 and 25 tonight. I'm handing you out a um, last page of what we have been studying on Wednesday nights. We're going to make sure that we've got enough here. Yeah, we'll be the, the passage that we'll be studying in the Bible will be Matthew 24 and 25. We're going to be looking at the return of the Lord Jesus and basically what the Bible has to say about that. <clears throat> but what I'm giving you is the very last page of what we've been studying on Wednesday nights called the Didache. And again, the Didache, just for those of you that haven't, haven't been here through the whole study, it is a very early first century document wrote, written toward the end of the first century or maybe the beginning of the second century. And the Didache is just simply a Greek word that means the teaching. That's all it means is the teaching. And so this was uh, what, what, what the early church would likely have used before. They believe it predates most of the Bible. They believe it predates most everything except for possibly the Gospel of Matthew and the book of James. Now again, I, I have never put this out as if it were something that we were going to look at as Holy Spirit inspired scripture. But I did feel like it was a very interesting document. I like to study a lot of early church literature. Uh, I also know that it, it, um, it's not something that I would recommend every Christian to go out and start looking through. But I do believe that... Um, this document was quoted by so many of the early church fathers that I felt confident that I could teach this along with the Word of God. We would always back everything up with the Word of God, but I felt confident that we could teach along with this and just see an early document that the early church used to kind of give them guidance on how they should live as Christians. And that's really what we found throughout the Didache is that it was simply an instruction manual that basically taught them as Christians how they should walk um, um, living in the image of Jesus Christ and what that should look like. And so much of what we have studied throughout, we backed up completely with Scripture. As a matter of fact, I don't remember that we found anything that we, that, that we looked at and said, okay, that's not... Um, that's not something that's biblical, and so we're going to turn away from it. I feel like everything we studied in the Didache backed up with Scripture, and it was a very interesting study all the way through. But tonight, the teaching that um, was a collection of the teaching of the Twelve Apostles to the Nations is the full title of the Didache. But the, the ending, the way they end it is by just titling it, The Lord is Coming. And that is very important because this is, yeah, can you come get this? Sorry, I'm working tonight. And... All right, so um, the Lord is coming is the title of it. And one of the things that I'd like for you to think about is the fact that this is supposed to be our Christian hope. The Bible teaches us that the Lord is coming for two reasons. The first reason the Lord is coming is He is coming to inflict judgment. He's coming to give vengeance. He's going to give the, the final judgment. Now we know that we have experienced some of the judgment of God throughout time mostly because of the curse of this world is the first way that Romans tells us the wrath of God is being revealed to us. We all experience the curse of this world. Okay. Y'all give me just a minute. I apologize. I mean, if y'all want to take showers in the morning, i got to do my job, right? So, um, if you don't want to shower, I'll keep preaching. Right.
54 and falling. 54 and falling. Yep. All right. Where was I? Taking showers in the morning. Showers in the morning. There we go. <laughs> so anyway, Jesus is coming back for two reasons, correct? The first reason is He is coming back for a final judgment. Now when I say a final judgment, again, we've seen uh, glimpses of His judgment on sin throughout history. The curse of this world being one of the main ways that we see it. We see it in sickness, we see it in death, we see it in the creation bracing itself against us. Uh, it's not supposed to be tornadoes and hurricanes and, um, and the land working against us. It's supposed to be to where everything worked with us. But the Bible tells us that when He cursed the world, that creation braced itself against us. Instead of it growing the food like we would like for it to, it bears thorns and thistles, and we work through sweat, and we work through tears. Instead of work being a good thing, work became labor. Work became very, um, very strenuous. Work became very difficult. Work became a curse, not a blessing. And so we see the, the judgment of God in little ways like that. But we also see the judgment of God whenever we go back and we read stories like Noah and the flood. And we see that there was a time where the Spirit of God, um, it quit striving with, with man for a time. And He came and He wiped it out and he, he rebuilt again. Or we see in cities where He did that, like Sodom and Gomorrah. And those are just biblical examples of it. But I believe we also see it in things like Hurricane Katrina. And I'm not saying that Hurricane Katrina, had that New Orleans had become like Sodom and Gomorrah. I don't know. I don't know why God allowed that to happen. All I'm saying is that those are absolute evidences of the judgment of God and it just being glimpses of the fact that it's coming in full one day. And so Jesus, when He returns, the Bible tells us that He is coming to inflict judgment, to pay vengeance on those who do not believe. And you could see that if you wanted to turn to, you don't have to, but you could turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, I believe it is. And you could see the where the Bible tells us when Jesus comes again, He's coming to inflict vengeance on those who do not believe the gospel, who do not believe God. And so that's one reason Jesus is coming. Another reason He is coming is because He is going to come and He's going to glorify and He's going to bring those that do believe and that are children of God, He's going to come back and He's going to bring them to the place that He has prepared for us. This is what Jesus told His disciples whenever He told them. He said, where I'm going, you can't come yet. He said, but I'm going to comfort you by telling you this. I am going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I am going to come back to bring you with me so that where I am, there you may be also. So again, two reasons Jesus is coming back. On the one hand, He's coming to judge and inflict vengeance on those that do not believe the gospel and do not believe God. On the other hand, He is coming back for those that do believe and that do belong to Him, and He is going to reward them, and He's going to glorify them where they will spend eternity with Him forever and ever in the place that He has prepared for us. But one thing we know for sure is that He is coming. Every time we take the Lord's Supper, you remember what uh, Paul said that the Lord's Supper was a proclamation of. He said, as often as you eat this bread and as often as you drink this cup, you proclaim what? The Lord's death until He comes. In other words, we are proclaiming that we know that Jesus has saved us from our sins, that He has made us right with God, that He has caused us to be adopted into the family of God, and we know that because of what He's done, one day He's coming back and we are going to be with Him, where He is forever and ever. That is our hope. This is the reason why we say that we are strangers and pilgrims in this land. We're exiles here. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. As the old song said, my treasure is laid up somewhere beyond the blue. 
This is not where our hope lies. Our hope lies in the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so it's important that we understand that we cannot get too comfortable in this life. We cannot get too complacent here so that we're no longer looking for the return, so that we're no longer hoping that one day we're not going to experience the judgment of God at all anymore. And this is one of the curses that we have. I'm going to call it like I see it. One of the curses that we have of living in this good old United States. I'm so thankful that I was born and raised in this United States. I really am. But can I also be honest with you and tell you that because I have it so good here in this world, there are many times that I lose sight of the fact that this world is not my home. You know, the truth of the matter is, sometimes we would really be much better off with a lot less than what we have so that we would truly see the curse of this world, so that we would truly see the judgment of this life, and then it would cause us to cast our hope on Him and His reward alone. But we have been so blessed, and we have been... um, Uh, received so much of the grace of God that I truly believe that you and I are in danger of not looking for the Lord's return the way that we should. And so tonight's lesson, that's what this is about. He says, the Lord is coming, and this is what he says at the end of the Didache. Watch over your life. There is a way for you to be living that demonstrates that you are waiting on the Lord Jesus. There is a way for you to be living that demonstrates that you belong to another world, to another king, that you serve a complete different master than what the world serves. And he says here that it is our responsibility if we're going to be Christians and living out a Christian life in this world, we have to keep watch over our lives because there are so many things that cause us to live according to the world and not according to the way that our Lord and Savior would call us to live. He tells us to keep watch over your life and then he says, do not let your lamps burn out. Now this points us back to the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ and what He taught us about looking for His return. And we're going to go to that in Matthew 24 and 25 here in a minute. But He says, Do not let your lamps burn out, and do not, and nor your waist be ungirded. In other words, you always need to be, I, I, I hate to say it like this, but strapped up and ready to go. You always got to be ready for action. You always be, got, be ready so that when, when He calls, we're ready to go. We're looking for that day. We're waiting on that day. We're keeping watch over our lives. And we're living in such a way that everybody around us can see that this world is not my home. That I am looking for that coming home that God has prepared for me. And so he says, but be ready for you do not know when our Lord is coming. Now this is important too because there have been so many people over the years that have tried to use the Bible to to calculate a time and they've said, well, the Lord is going to come back at this time and this time and this time. And as of yet, no one has hit it. And the truth of the matter is, even if someone did hit it, it would be a very lucky guess because the Bible teaches us that no one Not even the angels in heaven, not even the Son Himself. No one knows the day nor the hour that the Lord Jesus is going to return. All we know is that He is going to return. That's all the angels know. Do you remember in Acts chapter 1 whenever the disciples were listening to Jesus and He was fixing to ascend into the heavens and and the disciples said, Hey, are you going to restore the kingdom of God at this time? In other words, they're they're still expecting that He's going to come into Israel like we talked about last week and that He's going to reestablish Jerusalem at that time. He's going to throw out the Roman powers and He's going to be king and, and the Jews are going to be the kingdom again. And you remember what Jesus said to them? Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons when the Father has appointed for this to take place. 
And then He ascends up into heaven. You remember what the angels told the disciples? They said, why do you stand here gazing? The same way that Jesus went up is what? The same way that He's going to come back. So here's what the angels knew. The angels don't know the time. They don't know the place. They don't know, they don't know anything other than the fact that Jesus, in the same way He went up, is the same way He's coming back. And they know that Jesus is coming back. And that's what we know. And we long for that. And we hope for that. And we celebrate that. And we proclaim that. Every time we do the Lord's Supper, this is our hope. And so we need to live in such a way that we don't let our lamps burn out and our waist stays girded. We are ready for action. We're, we're, our, our, our cloaks are cinched up and we're ready to go no matter when the call happens. Look at Matthew chapter 24 with me. And we're going to start in verse 36. And then I'm going to skip over to where he talks about not letting your lamps burn out nor your waist be ungirded. Matthew 24, starting in verse 36. He says, But concerning the day and the hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor who? The Son don't even know. Jesus does not know. Jesus is waiting for the Father to say, Son, go get my children. He's waiting on that day. The Son does not know, but the Father only knows. And next He says, For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. So here He shows that the Son of Man is coming for judgment, just like the flood was coming in the days of Noah. But no one knows when that's going to happen. But it's going to be like it was in the days of Noah. Let's see what them days look like in verse 38. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were given in marriage. Now let me ask you a question. In the, the gist of eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, is there anything wrong in and of itself of, with eating? Is there anything wrong in and of itself with drinking? Is there anything wrong with marrying or giving in marriage? No. These are everyday, ordinary events, right? So what is he trying to say here? He's trying to tell us that while we're waiting on the judgment of God to come, on Jesus to come back, what's going to be going on in the world? Normal, everyday life is going to be happening. You are going to be eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, and that is going to be the focus of the world. The world is just continuing to focus on them things. And look what he says next. Until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. In other words... If you are not aware and watching and waiting on the coming judgment that He has said is coming, because remember, Noah preached and told the people that judgment was coming, did he not? But when it happened, they were unaware. Why? Because they did not believe what the Word of God said. They did not believe the preacher of God. They did not believe the one that God sent to warn them what was happening. If they had have believed, they would have been aware, they would have been watching, they would have been waiting, and they would have been just like Noah. You want to know how we know Noah believed God? He built an ark. He was ready. When the flood came, he was ready. He had been watching, he had been waiting. It did not catch him unaware. He listened to God, he believed God, he obeyed God. This is faith, my friends. Faith is not believing in Jesus. You know what James said about, about the demons and believing in Jesus? They believe in Jesus. That's not faith. That's not faith. Faith is, I hear the Word of God, I believe the Word of God, 
And because I believe the Word of God, it moves me in the direction of God. And I do what God says. That's faith. And so this is what we see is that they were, the world was unaware because they did not believe the Word of God. And why did they not believe? Because they were so caught up in all the things of everyday life that they didn't want to believe that judgment was coming. But how many of you know that the evidence was all around them? They experienced the curse of this world. They experienced sickness. They experienced death. You ought to be able to look around your life and there is no one that should have an excuse to say, I didn't know that there was judgment on this world. My friends, how many funerals do you go to in a lifetime? And you don't know there's judgment on this world? How many times have you planted and the flood washed it away? And you don't know there's judgment on this world? How many times have you built and a tornado come and knocked it down? And you don't know there's judgment in this world? How many times have you watched the hurricanes smash into the coast and you don't know there's judgment coming on this world? Judgment is all around us. And we have to hear the gospel that says you better be ready because there is a final judgment coming for each and every one of us. And we have to be ready and waiting for this. So keep reading with me. In verse um, 40. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one left. Therefore, what's the, what is his uh, warning that he tells us as far as being ready for his return right here? Stay awake. When, in other words, when this time comes, there are going to be so many that are unaware because they didn't believe the Word of God. They were going to be caught, so caught up in normal everyday life that they didn't listen to the Word of God, that they focused on all of the wrong things. Now again, in and of itself, Noah was married. Noah's wife had been given in marriage. Noah still had to eat and drink and provide for his family. In and of itself, there's nothing wrong with those things. But that is not where our focus is. And that's not where Noah's focus is. Noah's focus was building an ark. And our focus needs to be building an ark. You know how we build that ark? Christ is our ark. We're building that ark in what we're doing right now. We're building the ark of Christ in our life. We are learning from Christ. We're obeying Christ. We're honoring Christ with our life. And the more we grow in Christ, the more the ark gets built. And this is exactly what we are called to do so that we're not so focused on the ordinary, everyday things in this life that we go to sleep on the Lord Jesus and His judgment that is coming. Keep going with me in verse 42. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, what would he have done? Now this is not saying the Lord Jesus is a thief and He's coming to steal. This is just comparing or contrasting, if you will, and He's just telling you in the same way that you don't know when the thief is coming, do you? Because if you did, you'd have your six-shooter on and you'd be ready, would you not? But you don't know when it's coming. And most of the time He comes when you least expect it. And so you have to make sure that you understand that the coming of the Son of Man is going to be the same way. Don't you know that if I knew that the Lord Jesus was coming tomorrow evening, I would probably make tomorrow the day that I'm watching and waiting, wouldn't I? I'd probably make tomorrow the day that I make sure that I'm ready but the problem is this, I don't know when that is. And so I have to make sure I'm ready every day, every moment. And I'm always watching and I'm always waiting. And this is the point. Because we don't know when the Son of Man is coming and it will be at an hour that you do not expect. And so skip over with me to chapter 25 because he starts telling parables about how we need to make sure that um, we're ready when he comes. And the first parable he gives is in Matthew 25. Here's the first teaching that he really gives. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. 
For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Now I'm going to finish it here in a minute. But the first thing that I want you to understand is that this story, Jesus is telling about a wedding that they would have understood in this culture. In this culture, weddings were a little different than we have them today. For instance, there were basically three parts to a Jewish wedding. The first part was the engagement. Now we have that part in our wedding, right? But the problem with ours is that it's not really like it was back then. Back then the father of the bride and the father of the husband would get together and they would work out an agreement on um, whether or not the father was going to give his daughter to this man and vice versa, whether or not the father of the the groom was, was okay with this. And most of the time there would have to be a price that was paid for the bride. The husband or the groom here would have to come up with some type of what they called a dowry. Uh, It was a bride's price. And so the payment would be made and then the engagement would be complete. After the engagement there would be a betrothal. Now the betrothal usually lasted somewhere around a year's time. The betrothal would take place like this. They would come and they would have a ceremony. But they would not consummate the marriage for another year. The ceremony would just be the time to where they are taking the vows and they're exchanging their vows. Now during this betrothal time, it was going to be a legitimate marriage even though the two have not become one sexually yet. It was a time to where now the groom would now go and prove that he is able to provide for his wife. He would go and he would prepare a place for his bride. And so a lot of times he would go to his father's house and he would build another room onto his father's house. Why is this important? Because you remember what Jesus told his disciples? I have gone to what? Prepare a place for you. We have made our commitments to our groom, the Lord Jesus Christ. He has made his commitments to us. And now we are in the betrothal period. The engagement's already been made. The price has already been paid. And now we are waiting until the time that He prepares a place for us. You remember what He said? In my Father's house are many, not mansions, many what? Many rooms. That's a uh, mistranslation in a lot of Bibles. In my Father's house are many rooms. In other words, i got plenty of places for you to stay. i got plenty of places for us to make our life together. And then He says, but I am going to come back and receive you into myself, and where I am, there you may be always. A Jewish wedding mimicked this, um, this, the Lord Jesus and how He is our husband and we're His bride. And so basically, during this betrothal time, the husband has gone away, he's preparing the place, he's getting things ready, he's making sure that he can prove that he can provide for his bride. And then when that is done, usually about a year's time, Then the groom would come back. During this time, the bride has been making herself ready. The bride has been getting ready for this this wedding celebration and she's been watching and she's been waiting because she don't know when the groom is going to come. And most Jewish weddings, they would do it at midnight. Most Jewish weddings, it wouldn't take place in the morning time in the daylight. Most Jewish weddings, it would take place at midnight. And after the betrothal period was over and the husband had proved that he had prepared a place, then he would come back and with his groomsmen, he would come down the street going to the place where his bride, uh, bride-to-be lived and she would be there with a bridal party. Most of the time in this culture, the bridal party was made of virgins. So Jesus is just painting a picture here of a Jewish wedding that they would understand. You've got ten brides, or ten, you've got a bride with uh, ten virgins, and they are waiting on the groom to come because when the groom comes and cries, and he, they hear the cry, here comes the groom. Their job is to get up, to get their lamps trimmed, and they had these torches that they carried. 
And it, so it wasn't just a lamb, but they had these torches that had these cloths in them. And they would fill it with oil. And then they would light the torch up and that would last, if they had enough oil to replenish it, it would last for several hours. They would go out, they would meet the groom, and the whole bridal party would march back to the father's house where again, the ceremony has already taken place, but they would go back to where the wedding feast is being held and to where the bride is going to live with the groom. This is what Jesus is laying out right here. Read it with me again, Matthew 25 verse 1. The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. So here, they've got their lamps, they're waiting on the bridegroom. Now in verse 2, five of them were foolish, five of them were wise. Now this does not mean that 50% of the church is lost and they're not going to make it. And then again, it could, I don't know. But that's not the point that he's trying to make here. The point he's trying to make here is that There are a bunch of people that think that they're going to be part of the wedding feast. They're all virgins here. Now again, don't confuse sexuality with uh, purity and spirituality. That's not what he's saying here either. The fact is, culturally, they would have been virgins. It's just that simple. And so, here he says there was ten of them. Five of them were wise, five of them were foolish. Now let's see why. Verse 3, For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. So here they had the lamps. They acted like they were ready. They acted like they were waiting on the bridegroom to come. They they went to church. They studied the Bible or they read it maybe. Um, They even would even teach a Sunday school. Or they might would even pray in a church service. We don't know. Here's what we know. They acted like they were ready to go into the wedding feast. But they really didn't have the oil that was needed in order for them to go with the party. They wouldn't be able to see the way. And so he says next in um, verse 4, But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. They knew that the bridegroom was coming. They knew that there was going to be a wedding feast. They weren't just sitting there having fun and and doing bachelorette parties and just uh, uh, acting like um, uh, the, the the bridegroom may never come. No, they knew He was coming. They had flasks of oil with their lamps. In verse 5, But as the bridegroom was delayed... Now remember, we don't know the time, right? We don't know the hour. And that was the point of the Jewish wedding, was to be a physical picture of Jesus coming for His bride. Now remember what Paul said about marriage in Ephesians chapter 5? He said, this marriage has always been a great mystery. In other words, for many years the Jews put on this wedding and they did it this way, but they didn't really know what it meant until Jesus came and died for His bride and went to prepare a place for them and promised to come back to receive them again until all that took place. And that's the reason why Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, even though marriage is a great mystery, I'm saying it refers to Christ in the church. It is a physical picture of a spiritual reality. Everybody tracking with me? And so here in this wedding, we have Jesus the bridegroom is delayed. Because how many of you know that the early church expected Him to come back right then? You know how we know that? They went out and sold what? Everything they had so that everybody in the church had all things in common. Because as far as they were concerned, Jesus is coming back tomorrow or the next day. Not 2,000 years from now. And so they were living in such a way that they actually said, the Lord Jesus is coming back. We're just waiting on it. And I'm going to tell you something. Even though that's not something that God commands us to do, and Jesus never commanded us to do that, it was evidence that they were ready. They were waiting on Him. But here in this parable, the bridegroom is delayed, and they all became drowsy and slept. And let me tell you something, all that Jesus is saying here is that the same thing happens 
with people in today, whether you're wise or foolish, how many of you know that there are times that even the wisest of those waiting on the bridegroom to come fall asleep and get drowsy? And so Jesus points that out here. He says, while the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But, look at verse 6, but at midnight, again, they would have known because this is the way a Jewish wedding went. But at midnight, there was a cry. So here we see the bridegroom. He is finally, the time is appointed. The father said, all things are ready. Go get your bride. He gathers his groomsmen together. They walk down the street and then there's a cry probably from the best man that says, hey, here comes the bridegroom. And it's about midnight that they hear this. And he says, come out to meet him. Now their job is to get up light their lamps, make sure they've got oil sufficient to get there, and they, this is their ticket to get into the wedding party and go back to the wedding feast. And then in verse 7, Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. They all heard the cry. Verse 8, And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. Now this is pretty... Interesting to me. They all get up and trim their lamps. But here's the problem. Why are you trimming your lamp if you ain't got no oil? And this is the dumbest thing that they could do. The fact of the matter is, is that they have lived this life like they were these um, part of the wedding party that's getting ready for the bridegroom to come. They have lived their life. They have been in the church. They have sung the songs. They prayed the prayer. They've done, they've done all the things that all the other part of the bridal party have done. The problem is that they never really had any oil. In other words, they never really had any genuine saving faith. Do you know how I know that? The same reason I know that Noah had genuine saving faith because he was ready when the, when the judgment came. The same way I know that Lot had genuine saving faith. You know how I know that? Because when, rain, when fire and brimstone rained down on Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot was on his way out. He believed. He believed. He trusted. He had genuine saving faith. If these guys or if these women here had genuine saving faith, they would have had all. Five of them had it. Five of them didn't. What was the evidence of the five that had genuine saving faith? They were watching. They were waiting. They didn't let their lamps go out. Did they get sleepy? Yeah, they got sleepy. Did they get drowsy? Yeah, they got drowsy. Did they even go to sleep at times? Yes, but they were always prepared. They were always watching. They were always waiting for the bridegroom to come. They had genuine saving faith. And now he goes on, he says in verse 8, And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will be not enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. So here is the thing that Jesus is pointing out in this scripture. I can't give you some of my salvation. You can't give your children some of your salvation. Everyone has to have their own oil. Everyone of Noah's family had to have their own genuine saving faith. Just like Lot and Lot's wife had to have their own genuine saving faith. But guess what? Lot did, but his wife didn't. You know how we know? She looked back. She looked back. She, she could not stand the thought of losing what God was destroying. She did not see enough joy and reward in what God was promising to fix her eyes on that and move toward that. Oh, come on, somebody, I'm preaching tonight, ain't I? You have to see enough joy and enough... 
you have to see more reward in what God is promising you when Jesus returns than anything you have right now. And like I said, this is difficult. Because again, we are blessed people, are we not? We don't, really, we don't really experience a lot of the curse of this world until one of our kids gets sick. Then you realize there ain't no hope in this world, don't you? We don't really experience the curse of this world until, until we lose our job and we lose our home and we, can't, and we can't pay for things anymore. And then all of a sudden we remember this world is cursed and there's no hope in it. And there is so much greater reward in what God has promised me than anything this world has to offer. So he says here, The wise answered, There's not enough for us and for you, so go to the dealers and get your own oil. That's the only choice you have. But the problem is if you wait until this point, you've waited too late. If you wait until this point, you've waited until late. Verse 10, And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to what? The marriage feast. Again, you see the picture that he's painting here? This was not some, something they didn't understand. They knew exactly what he was talking about. They see this whole picture. And they said the ones that were ready... They go into the wedding feast with the bridegroom. And then the door was shut. And let me tell you something. The reason why Jesus said that is because once the door is shut, nobody else is coming in. Either you go in when the bridegroom calls and you're ready and your lamp is still burning, or... You did not believe and you did not have enough oil. You did not have genuine saving faith and the judgment of God caught you unaware. And so here he just says to us very plainly, make sure that your lamp keeps burning. Verse 11, Afterward the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord. Now what does that tell you about what they believed? Did they say, um, did they say, Hey, neighbor. No, they said, Lord. Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. This is some scary scriptures. Some scary scriptures. And so what does he say in verse 13 is the remedy for this? Watch. Watch, therefore. If you will always keep your focus and your eyes on the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you will always understand that this world is cursed, it's not my home, it's not where my hope is. Do I still have to eat? Do I still have to drink? Uh, Is it still okay to marry and be given in marriage? Absolutely. All those things are honorable. But if that's where your life is, and that's where your focus is, you're going to be no different than the ones in Noah's day that were caught unaware. Unaware. Why? Because they did not believe the Word of God that was preached to them over and over again. One day, you will not be able to say to God, God, we didn't know. We didn't know your judgment was coming. We didn't know that that, that we had to be ready. No. No. He's going to look at every, every single person and say, you knew, one way or another, you knew, either through general revelation or special revelation. And what I mean by that is Romans talks about general revelation being the fact that everyone's able to look at creation and know that there is a Creator. Everybody, even if they've never heard the gospel, they have general revelation about the Creator that there is a higher power and He is worthy of worship. But then we have special revelation that it's our job to get to all the nations and to all the people. And that special revelation tells us much more than just that He's a Creator. It tells us who He made us to be and how we have fallen short of it 
and where we stand with Him and what He has done to save us from that. And so no matter which one you have, no one will ever be able to stand before God and say, but I didn't know judgment was coming. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. The question is, why didn't you believe it? Why didn't you seek me while there was still time for you to get ready for the coming judgment? So again, he says here, watch over your life and the Didache. Do not let your lamps burn out and do not let your waist be ungirded. In other words, don't be caught unprepared to go when it's time to go. Make sure that you're watching and that you're staying awake and that you're ready. Make sure that you have all, that you have genuine saving faith. And then the next parable in Matthew 25 is the parable of the talents. I'm not going to go through this because most of you should know this parable. But again, every one of these parables, the point that he's making is this is how to make sure you're ready. You've got to be wise and make sure you've got oil in your lamp. You've got, to, you've got to make sure that you're not like the people in Noah's day who were caught unaware or the people in Sodom and Gomorrah's day that were caught unaware. You've got to listen to the Word of God, the preaching of God. You've got to put your, put your focus on the promises of God and believe God. And if you believe God, then your life will demonstrate that as you follow Him. The same way Noah did, the same way Lot did, the same way Abraham did, the same way Moses did. Shall we go on and on and on? Or can I just tell you, go read Hebrews chapter 11. Faith always follows the direction of its hope. Always. And if your faith is not following the direction of your hope, then can I tell you, you need to wake up. You need to wake up or... Maybe you need to evaluate whether or not there is actual genuine saving faith in your life. Do I really believe the Word of God? Do I believe that when God says, I'm coming to destroy this place? Do I believe that? And if I do, what am I doing to prepare for it? What am I doing to make sure I'm ready for it? And so watch over your lives. Do not let your lamps burn out, nor your waist be ungirded. But be ready, for we do not know when our Lord is coming. Another way He tells us to be ready in Matthew 25 here, He talks about the parable of the talents. And simply He says that for all of those servants, whether and now He moves from virgins and He talks about like a master or a businessman that was rich enough to be able to give a stewardship to servants. And to some, one servant He gives... He gives ten talents, and a talent was basically a year's wage, all right? And he gives ten talents. To another one, he gives five talents. To another, he gives one talent. And he says, hey, I'm going away, and while I'm gone, I want you to use what I've given you, and I want you to, to bear and gain fruit for me when I come back. And you know how the story goes. The master comes back. The one that he gave ten talents, what did he do? He used it. He made ten more. The one that he gave five talents, what did he do? He used it and he gained five more. The one that he gave one talent to, anybody remember what he did? And you remember what he said? Look down with me at Matthew chapter 25 beginning in verse, um, verse 24. He also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man. Now don't get me wrong, is it true that God can be a hard man? <laughs> you better believe it. But that ain't the way servants talk. You remember what the prodigal son said about his, his father, about his master? He said, even the hired servants have plenty of bread to eat and more. He remembered the father's love. He remembered the father's compassion. He didn't remember that he was hard and that he wouldn't let him do anything and that, that he had to go off just to live his life. That's not what he remembered. But this is a wicked servant. He says, I knew you to be a hard man. He says, you reap where you did not sow. Now listen, if he knew that he reaped where he did not sow, why didn't he use the talent? You see what I'm saying? He didn't believe what he knew about God. If he had have believed that... He would have used the talent. But then he goes on, he says, I knew that you gathered where you scattered no seed. 
And don't you know that that's true about God? But he didn't really believe it. Because look what he says in verse 25. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown. And you knew that I gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have at least invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has more will be given and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast that worthless servant into outer darkness. In the place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Here's the point. How do we watch and we be ready for his coming, for the master coming back? We're taking everything that he's given us and we're using it to try to gain fruit for him. No matter what it is. I'm just taking any money he gives me, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to invest back in His kingdom. I'm taking any talent He gives me, and I'm trying to invest back into His kingdom. Whether it's singing, teaching, praying, uh, ministering to someone, serving someone, loving someone, no matter what it is, I'm trying to take everything that He's given me, and I'm just taking and doing whatever I can, because I know one thing. He's coming back. Well, maybe I know two or three things. He's coming back, and I also know that He reaps where He does not sow, and He gathers where He scatters no seed. And so even when I don't think this ground can grow nothing, if God, if I'll use what God's given me, and I will minister with care with that, He provides the increase. And so again, how do we watch? How do we be ready? We make sure we see genuine saving faith in our life. We make sure that we're not like Lot's wife or the people of Noah's day that were so caught up in the world that they didn't focus on the promise of God. That promise is judgment is coming. But I'm going to save those that are ready. And I took the things that God gave me and I used them to bring Him fruit in His kingdom. To do what I could. Not that I had to uh, have ten just because He gave me ten, but you know what? He's going to provide the increase and I'm going to take whatever He gives me and I'm going to use it however He sees fit. And when He comes back, I'm not going to say, I knew you were a hard man. I'm going to say, I knew you were a loving, a loving God. And I knew you reaped where you didn't sow. So you know what? I just scattered the seed. I took care in making sure I tried to minister where you would have me minister and at the end of the day you provided the increase. And when you see those things in your life and then you can go on to the end of it. I'll stop here. But you go on to the end of chapter 25 and he talks again about when God comes back and he puts the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. You remember what he says to them? He says, Come you on my right who are blessed by the Father because I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty. You gave me drink. I was naked and you clothed me. And they said, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or naked? When did we do that? And he said, I tell you, when you did it to the least of one of these, my brethren, you did it to me. In other words, what's another way we can watch and be ready and make sure that we have our oils in our lamps and we are using our talents is just simply by loving the people that God puts in the family. It's simply by serving one another. It's simply by making sure. I'll end with this scripture. Look with me at 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. This is the last scripture I'll give you. Verse 7 through 12. First John chapter 4, verse 7 through 12. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us. In other words, here's the reason why you will love if you love. 
Because God revealed His love to you. How did He do it? God sent His only Son into the world that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. In other words, if you have experienced the love of God in Jesus Christ, if you've seen yourself for who you really are, <laughs> let me tell you something, I know who I am. I know who I am. And I can say with the Apostle Paul that I know that in my flesh there is nothing good. Let me tell you something. You think Hitler was bad? You ought to dig down deep inside of this old heart sometimes outside of the Spirit of God. I know what I'm capable of. I know who I am. But the reason why I love the way that I love is because if He would give His Son to die for somebody like me? That changes a man. That changes a man. And all I'm saying to you is that those that are watching and waiting, it will be evident by the way they minister in love to the brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. And that's the point of Matthew 25 at the end of it. And so... I end by saying this. Jesus really is coming again. Let me tell you something. Just as sure as the flood came, and let me tell you, they mocked Noah on that, didn't they? They mocked him. But it came, and it wiped them all out. Just as sure as the fire and the brimstone rained down on Sodom and Gomorrah, the judgment of God is coming when the Son of God comes again. And you're going to be either on His right or on His left. The ones on His right are the ones that were watching and waiting. And the ones on His left, there will be many, many that were part of the bridal party, that were given talents, that were even in the midst of God's people but He's going to look at them and say, I never knew you. I never knew you. And it will be because they did not truly believe. It will be because of unbelief. And if you believe, it will be demonstrated in your life by you watching and waiting for the Lord Jesus to return. Again, are you going to get sleepy? <laughs> yeah. Are you going to get drowsy and even go to sleep from time to time? Yes. But you are always going to have oil in your lamp. And you're always going to be ready and waiting for His return. And when you hear that cry, you had your waist girded and you knew it's time and I'm ready. It ain't going to catch you by surprise. You know, I just wonder, if the cry came out tonight, here comes the groom how many of us would be caught surprised? And we would say, I need some oil. I don't, I don't have any oil. You up here, you're trying to trim your lamp, but you ain't got no oil. You're just going through the motions like you've always went through. And that's the warning. That's the warning to each and every one of us tonight. And that's the way the Didache ends. Watch for the Lord is coming.